welcome you to the Book Rex uh, panel. Uh, we're going to start off with just the panelists. So we are in a Zoom webinar. If you're not familiar, that means you just see us, but you can communicate with us through the chat or the, the Q&A. Uh, I think we will have the panelists talk for a little bit uh, and then kind of open it up for chat. Uh, and I'm going to suggest questions through the chat, just that way I can sort of just monitor one thing at a time and I'll kind of read stuff off so the panelists don't have to keep scrolling through stuff to find what question are we talking about uh, at this point. But just to start off with introductions, so I am Alan Irvind. I am here in Pittsburgh where I'm a local storyteller and uh, run a small theater company, do some directing. But I think what has me on this panel is I also I do uh, book reviews for our monthly um, newsletter, uh, Sigma, and also have a monthly blog called storystuff.blog, where it's kind of reactions to stories of all sorts and different types of reviewing, uh, things like that. So that is me. Uh, we'll have the panel go around and we said just kind of brief introductions and Mary, you are next to me on my screen, so we'll start with you. Hi, I'm Mary Soon Lee. I write science fiction and fantasy and sometimes science poetry. Um, and I also read a lot and I review almost everything I read on Goodreads and on Amazon. Um, and I, reading was my first love, well before writing. Uh, Michelle. I'm Michelle Segarra. I'm also Michelle West. Uh, I write fantasy novels. I write the cast series. I write the House War series was the one that was recently finished. I review books for the magazine of science fiction, of fantasy and science fiction. Oh my God. <laughs> I know, it's been a long day. <laughs> I spent the day with you, Never mind. So that's probably why I'm here. But like Mary, I loved reading when I was... I don't know, even with sex. Mm -hmm. My mother wanted to encourage it so she'd leave me alone if I was reading. So mm -hmm. you have these moments of privacy and moments of connection. Mm -hmm. And I guess for me, writing as a career comes through reading as a great love and minor obsession. <laughs> uh, Scott. You might know me from a multiplicity of hats, depending on where you come from. On the one hand, I host a podcast called Eating the Fantastic. I'm wearing the Eating the Fantastic t-shirt right now, and I take writers out for breakfast, lunch, dinner, clip on microphones, and just chat about life. I have 128 episodes so far over the last four and a half years. Rachel has been a guest on that podcast. We chatted last year during the uh, Nebula Awards weekend, and I do a lot of reading relating to those writers. I, I pick writers I've read for years and also writers I've never read before so I can learn about new writers, meet them, and find out what makes them tick. Or you might know me as a writer, uh, published about 100 short stories, and my new collection, Things That Never Happened, which is fantasy horror stories, was just published by Cemetery Dance September 22nd. Hold the cover, uh, What's that? Hold the cover up again. Things that never happen. There is a death's head moth inside a... Yeah, actually, I like that cover. Okay, sorry, head. I'm coming up now. It looks like a Co horror. Cover, des cover designed by Lynn Hansen. I'll just say one last thing. You might know me. I wrote comics in the 70s and 80s as well. That was my first writing career. And I'm the co-creator with Alan Milgram of the character uh, Dr. Minerva, who was played by Gemma Chan in a recent Captain Marvel movie. So that was that's the other life I've had. Right. And Rachel. Hi, um, I'm Rachel Swirsky. Um, I write short stories. I'm trying to write a novel. They're really long. Um, and I've won a couple <laughs> of awards. I used to come on panels and say, I write short stories, not novels, because I have no attention span. And yet, for some reason, it took until last summer to go in and actually say, oh, do I have ADD? Okay, well, good to know. Um, I, my parents, uh, my mom is a librarian. My dad just likes to read a lot. So they had a huge shelf of all the science fiction 
um, <laughs> when I was a kid. Um, and I just put this in chat, so I'll go ahead and read it. But um, when I was at Clarion West, one of my teachers, uh, Timmy Duchamp, who runs Aqueduct Press and does a lot of very, very thoughtful critiquing, told me that a very thoughtful review is like a gift. And when you look at the ones, um, I mean, not everything's like a gift. I have had <laughs> where people like swear at me. That wasn't great. Um, and sometimes when you're writing for a magazine, you only have one line and you're like, this is not all the things I want to say about your story. I'm sorry. Um, but she said that very thoughtful reviews are like a gift. And I try to keep that in mind um, when I read, you know, people who are really interacting with my stories and also when I'm trying to interact with other people's work. That's great. Well, I thought before we get to the reviews, a couple of questions just so people can put our re reviews and recommendations in the context. So we've heard a bit about what people write. So maybe the question around is, what do you like to read? So uh, Mary, back to you. Okay. Well, I do like to read science fiction and fantasy. Um, probably I've been reading more fantasy than science fiction recently, but it's still fairly even. Um, I read some nonfiction and some mainstream things. I read poetry, which is often, but not always science fiction and fantasy poetry. Um, and I, I wasn't, I'm primarily thinking about the panel. I primarily thought about science fiction and fantasy things I'd read recently that I liked, but I, I can certainly attempt to summon up what I read that was nonfiction that I liked and so on, if, if, if anyone wants it. Scott. Well, without giving away anything about stories I'm going to be talking about and recommending, uh, I, what matters to me are the, uh, the confident voice of a writer. Those are the, that's the thing that actually tracks me the most. I'm reading a story and I know that the author knows what's going to happen next and I'm carried along uh, feeling that they know what know what's happening, that, that the words are in the right order. I know this is very vague and, and, and more stylistic, but um, the, the, I am very attentive to the prose of a story. So I like the writers whose prose is as polished as poetry. Um, so I'm very attentive to that. So yeah, it, without telling specific writers and giving it away, it, it's, uh, it's difficult to say what I write. But obviously, I've lived my life within uh, science fiction, fantasy, the fantastic, the things that don't necessarily happen in this world because uh, uh, we, we use metaphors to describe the human uh, condition, but uh, I want to be swept away and believe the author knows what she's doing, which is again a very vague thing to say and a very <laughs> vague quality to put into effect without uh, listing. Let's say just I'll, I'll toss out people we're not going to be talking about now since this is about newer books, but let's just say some of the authors whom I love: uh, uh, Alice Sheldon, James Tipry Jr., Ursula uh, Le Guin. Um, Carol M. Schwiller comes to mind. There are a whole bunch of people like that, but people who are very much into the exact right word in the exact right order, and they're not rushing along. So if any of that makes sense, it may be too vague. I, get a little too I don't know. I want to know if any author truly internally believes that they know what they're doing when they're trying to write a novel. Because I'll tell you, by the end of my process for me, I don't. It's like, so uh, it's hard. It's well, hard. writing a novel is a process of learning how to write that novel. Exactly. So that, yeah. now, I think the finished version can certainly be something that makes you feel like the person knows the structure. They know what they're doing. But uh, when you're floundering at the edges, it's like, shouldn't I know how to do this by now? Yeah. <laughs> You'll beat your head against a wall. Uh, so, Rachel, what do you like to read? Um... <clears throat> Well, I have had an interesting experience, which makes this panel interesting for me. I'll do my best. Um, is I actually have been sick for the past couple of years, and I didn't read for a couple of years, which is I have read my entire life since I turned three, hundreds of books a year. So it's been an interesting experience. And I'm starting to read again and figuring out um, what I can read while I'm sick and in what, what works out for me. Um, I have um, typically read many books a year, I read a lot of science fiction and fantasy. For a while I was on the Norton jury, so I would read um, a lot of science fiction and fantasy, young adult and middle grade, so I know a lot of that. 
And um, I also, uh, until recently, tried to keep up with the um, as much short story publishing as I could and novellas and so on. I was reading about 500 year, uh, pieces a year and it still it's, doesn't scratch the surface really. I mean, that's just what I get from reading a selection of professional magazines and doing some other ways to sift individual stories out. So short stories. <laughs> yeah, all right. And uh, Michelle. I kind of pick up a book that sounds interesting to me and I start it. So a little bit like Scott and I will either keep going or I won't. It doesn't mean the book isn't right. I was saying actually in chat, I find reading is so incredibly emotionally contextual. Mm -hmm. I used to try to actually kind of give a snapshot of where I was mentally because sometimes I want to read Terry Pratchett. Mm -hmm. And actually I wept when I found out about the Alzheimer's because he was the only author in that I'd found that I could read in any state of mind. I could be in the pit of despair and Pratchett's words could still reach me. And so what I can read, what I am reading is often a product of where I am emotionally. And there are books that I have loved that I bounce right off of in the wrong state of mind. I can't get back to that state of mind. Right now, are we, are we allowed to actually just say, this is a book that I read that I loved, or are we supposed to wait? No, <laughs> well, go ahead. I actually uh, picked up, or what you will, by Joe Walton, praying to God that the, the title did not actually mean that you would have to read Shakespeare in order to have actually, to actually <laughs> get stuff out of this book. And I loved it. And yeah, actually, you yeah, have to at least know a couple of the plays. I really loved it. And somebody asked me why. And I said, because it does all the things I love about a Neil Stevenson book in a book that he would never in a hundred million years write. <laughs> There's that dispersion of thought. There's that aside in which, you know, they're talking about morning customs or other things because they're kind of more than one narrator. It's a, it's a very odd book. And I really, really liked it. But it, I had the brain space to kind of go, wait, what? And she does a couple of interesting things with structure. It's a bit of a meta fiction, which some people do like and some people don't. I really, really liked it a lot. So that we'll just go one for one. Okay. I suppose I should answer my own question here. So, uh, I, I always have my mind I read science fiction, but when I look at the books, it's mostly fantasy these days. Uh, and a range between middle grade, young adult, and an adult bit. A lot of, actually a lot of historical stuff, uh, particularly historical mysteries in the last few years. And almost all novels, uh, with the exception of ghost stories. So, uh, and that's another thing, we're coming into ghost story season, so it's time to pull the big, giant, thick collections off the shelves. And then beyond that, history and a lot of particularly Elizabethan history, both out of interest and because I use that for a lot of world building stuff and teach a lot of Shakespeare classes and things. So uh, that's where I'm sort of coming from there. So, uh, yeah, so we've, with that, Michelle has started us off with a recommendation. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just did. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. And Scott has been hinting that he has things he wants to go. So let, let's uh, open it up uh, with uh, some other recommendations. So, Scott, what are some of those that you were trying to dance around? Okay, well, I'll, I'll mention one. But first, I want to add on what Michelle said to say uh, to praise Joe Walton just with a sentence before I go on that there are some writers I read who I love because I can tell they're smarter than I am. <laughs> I would put someone like Gene Wolfe in that category, and Joe Walton is definitely in that category. So those are writers we really feel this is someone who knows the stuff, and am I a smart enough reader to follow along? I always enjoy it, but they're, they're just wonderful in that way. But meeting Gene Wolfe the first time, I don't know what I was expecting. He is down to earth. He is, it, it made it clear to me that all the stuff that he knows 
He knows because it's like a box of the best toy ever and he needs to know more about it. It, it was just, it was really interesting. Um, oh, yeah. so, well, there are people who are smarter than you who want to hold it and lord it over you and want to basically say you're foolish for not knowing these things. But the good smart people are the ones who say, <laughs> lucky you, you don't know this wonderful gift. thing. Yet. Yes, exactly. Share. That's what I felt when Which I met him. Which fandom should be, but that's a whole other panel, you know, instead of, you know. But, but okay, the one, the one book I'll mention, um, and probably others will want to I'm glad this is newer or new-ish rather than new, <laughs> because this is like 13 months old. So I'm counting that uh, within new. Um, every once in a while I read a book and I say this is an important book in addition to just being uh, a good book. I felt that way maybe four or five years ago when I read Cory Doctorow's Little Brother that this was something that mattered to society and what was going on in politics uh, at the time. And I felt that way when I read A Song for a New Day by Sarah Pinsker, which now that it's won awards, perhaps it is not something that some, no one's going to go, oh, I hadn't heard of that book before. So this is not an unknown uh, book, A Song for a New Day, but I read this in November when it came out, pre-COVID-19, pre the world changing, and even then I said, this is an important book and has things to say about the relationship to society and relationship to our government and what the government will have us do. Now, to explain for those who have not read the book, uh, this a point of view of two different characters one who is a, a track musician who goes around and likes just picking up going from town to town uh doing shows and then all of a sudden wow a, a terrorist attack a plague explosion happens and all of a sudden people are forbidden to leave their homes they're not allowed to have mass <laughs> gatherings uh and the musicians if they do want to perform in public have to sort of sneak around and do it in basements where the governments will raid them arrest them uh, but the only way you are allowed to perform is in this sort of virtual reality uh, with this mega corporation that's sort of a combination between Walmart and Amazon and all the, all the evil conglomerates out there who want to hire bands and uh, have them appear to you through virtual reality. So you go to a concert, you sit in your home alone, wear your goggles and, and enter a concert. And then the other point of view character is someone who goes around attempting to find uh, the talent uh, and make them join this VR world and you know and give up this roadie way of life. Uh, the author's name is Sarah Pinsker for someone who asked again, a song for a new day by Sarah Pinsker. And I read this in November before we were in a similar state. And uh, as I mentioned to Sarah, the fact that this book came out last November before we were living in her novel, uh, we're all very thankful because if it had come out this November, everyone would say, oh, look at this writer. She just uh, took the real world and made it into a novel. <laughs> Anyone who knows publishing knows it takes years to get a novel out, and that is not what the story would have been with this book. Uh, but I think this book is even more important now in the state of the world that we're in now than it was prior uh, you know, to what went on. So I highly recommend this book. It is uh, beautifully written, um, and, and balancing two characters is also a, a difficult thing to do, two point of views, and have, uh, often when you're reading, I'll just say one more thing and shut up and pass it on, but often when you're reading a multiple point of view book, you're saying, oh, let's finish up with this one and go back to the other one. I really care about the other character, <laughs> uh, and so it's very difficult for an author to balance it so you care equally about both characters and don't feel cheated when, when you shift from one to the other. And in this case, uh, both characters are equally important. Uh, the book is important, and you should all go track it down and read it if you haven't already. Uh, Mary? Well, first of all, I will try to very quickly, because I don't want to take long over this, but to <laughs> say I also really like Joe Walton. And the book of hers, it's not one of her more recent ones that, um, that spoke to me most, was Among Others. and as well as the emotional context that Michelle talked about, there's also sort of your own background. And uh, I grew up in England reading science fiction and fantasy about the same time as the main character in Among Others was growing up in England reading science fiction and fantasy. So there was a commonality there that really made it resonate for me. Um, and then to Scott's, to Scott's one, um, the, the song for a new day, um, 
uh, was a book that I read in February, I think. Anyhow, it was just as you could see that the pandemic was coming because it was <laughs> you know, elsewhere, but not yet in the US um, or not yet known to be in the US. And uh, I think it's, it's, another, it's another excellent book, but I won't try and repeat everything that Scott said. Um, so I thought instead that I would like to just talk briefly about Martha Wells because she is the guest of honor. And at the moment, she has most recently got a, a novel, effect. The Network Effect, which mm -hmm. is equal to the fairly recent Murderbot novellas, which began with All Systems Red. But you can find them because she's the guest of honor. You'll be able to look it up, look her up, remember who she is. The Murderbot books are great. I really enjoyed them. They're very clever science fiction. The main character, um, I don't want to give away too much, but the one of the things that's interesting is how little is definitively said about the main character. Um, they're not given a gender. Um, we don't know. They're partly human and partly machine slash computer, but she doesn't make it clear how much, you know, what the proportion is, how human they are, or how machine-like. Um, and they, they talk about all kinds of big issues. But, but not explicitly. It, explicitly, it's just what's happening to the main character and so on, and the people she gets involved in, and they're great. But <laughs> then it turns out, having really enjoyed those, I thought, well, what else did she write? And she wrote a set of fantasy books called The Books of the Raxura. And there are seven books, two of which are collections of novellas and short stories, and five of which are full-length novels. And they are fabulous. It turns out they are, you know, among the fantasy I've most enjoyed in years, the characters, I, maybe it is partly because I read these during COVID and I'm looking for something where you like the characters. You know, the writing is great, the world building is great, the imagination is great, but the characters are likable. I mean, the good ones, not that there aren't some evil ones. Um, and so I just really liked escaping into their world. And I, 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 I think some of them will stay with me, you know, like characters that Le Guin wrote, that they will be characters in my mind um, forever, probably. So I really, really like them, but I should let Rachel say something. <laughs> um, I have been making notes. I've been making notes on a penguin shaped pad. So, you know. Um, that I also have doodled on. <clears throat> um, I would like to recommend Driftwood by Marie Brennan. Um, it's actually a fix-up novel, um, which for folks who don't know is a novel that incorporates a bunch of short stories that are already um, uh, written, uh, many of them already published. I have not read the fix-up. What I have read is many of the short stories. Um, the world of Driftwood is um, sort of place where everybody's apocalypses are colliding. As universes collapse, the um, planets that have the end of the, the world sort of um, geologically thrust into each other. So you get these blends of little, little apocalyptic settings that are swirling toward um, destruction. And um, the thing that I find very rewarding about them is that Marie actually um, has a degree in anthropology and you can really tell. So getting to read about lots of different rich cultures that are building onto um, each other and are both incredibly varied and also stand on their own is actually what cultures look like. Uh, that's very rare. Most people don't necessarily have enough of an idea of how a culture functions to make sure all the cultures have um, pillars behind them to be stable. Um, I find that to be very rewarding. Um, I have most of that written out, which I'll put into a uh, chat. Um, I, um, some of these are a bit old, but I actually wanted to mention, because I think that uh, none of these made as strong an impact within the genre community as would have been cool, in my opinion. Um, one of them is Carmen, uh, Carmen Maria Machado. Um, she's actually, she won the National Book Award, I believe. Um, she's done incredibly well within the literary sphere. Uh, people don't realize that her first sale was actually to Lightspeed. Um, and she has been uh, in both communities. She's taught at Clarion East, I think. 
San Diego. Um, and her work is among the most powerful stuff that I have ever read. Her um, novelette, yes, novelette, Black Ribbon, uh, was up for the Nebula a few years ago and is absolutely stunning. Um, her collection is called, I think, Her Body and Other Parties. Um, all the names they use for God, I'll go ahead and put these in chat afterward, by Anjali Sakdeva is a uh, collection of stuff that's on a marginal literary um, surrealist line, um, which doesn't didn't seem to have registered with a lot of sci-fi folks. Uh, likewise, I was able to review for Locus, Mrs. Fox by Sarah Hall, which is another collection of short stories that came out within the last couple of years that is right on that edge. Um, and I think, I think it's odd how strongly separate our recommendations end up being for science fiction, fantasy, and, and lit, even when uh, some of the stuff is just the same stuff. It was just published in Granta instead of Lightspeed, or Lightspeed instead of Granta. So um, those are some short stories. I've got some other thoughts, but I can wait for the next go through. Okay. And <clears throat> me, well, I've got the top of my pile, probably because it's uh, one of the f times I'm ahead of the curve. I'm usually many years behind everyone else in finding books, but because I found this one in England and so picked it up there before it came out here in the US and going over to, as I said, middle grades uh, work. So it is, sorry, the chat is covering my, you know, Malamander by Thomas Taylor. And it's an example of what I've uh, since come to think of as a very minor subgenre of sort of orphan boy detectives in strange, fantastic uh, villages. Uh, like the All the Wrong Questions series and a couple of others I've stumbled across. But yes, yeah, it's set in a little seaside town someplace. Our main character is an orphan boy who's sort of the messenger boy in a strange hotel. And all of a sudden this girl comes uh, basically dashing through the window into his room in the basement saying, hide me before this sort of creepy pirate-like guy comes storming into the hotel demanding, has anyone seen her? And it sets off a quest for something called the Malamander, this fabled creature who, when we see it, seems to be something like the creature from the Black Lagoon, uh, who apparently lays an egg of great power, if you can find it, if this creature even exists and maybe the disappearance of the girl's parents are connected to it. And there are other people in the town who seem to have sort of odd interest. And it's a sort of seaside town in the winter with lots of fog and atmosphere and empty streets and like a book dispensary instead of a library. So it's a place and you go you, and it sort of cranks out. You put your coin in a one of these little hand crank machines and it cranks out basically the prescription for the book you should read, uh, which then you have to go and find and just all sorts of little oddball stuff like that to work through. So it was a fun little one to play with. Uh, yeah, and uh, Having gone through that and trying to recall it off of memory when I haven't looked at it uh, in months, it was completely throwing me off uh, any train of thought uh, that I had here. So I guess uh, everyone got one in. Is there another one you want to, to sneak in here? So Michelle. It's actually, uh, I believe it's middle grade. I'm not as good at classifications of other <laughs> genres. It's called The Girl and the Ghost by Hannah Elkaf. Um, apparently based on a Malaysian folktale, but of course I didn't know it. So I picked it up because I have sometimes a small weakness for what ghost stories structurally represent when they're not all about horror and revenge. Actually, no, even then. But the good ghost stories, and in this case, well, no. Okay, let me say, the ones that appeal to me, let me just go back from good, are often ones that do deal with grief, 
uh, death and the weight of the one because of the other. And there are no easy um, answers emotionally. There's not really easy answers here. That I found the end uh, both predictable but also completely surprising on an emotional level. And it, it is just, it's really lovely and it is very true. There are some middle grade novels that absolutely work that way. And this is one of them. So I would actually recommend it, not as something that you necessarily uh, give to your kids, but as something that is moving and strong and quiet in its own right. Then you know, it's the identity of the ghost in the end that is the thing that's a little bit surprising that I'm shutting up now. <laughs> yeah, Scott. Yeah, have another oh, one. oh, I thought Mary had her hand up. Why don't we let Mary go? go, go, go ahead. Oh, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, Scott, do you want to go? I'm oh, okay. Uh, next book. See, sometimes I read actual books, not just ones on Kindle, so I have things to hold up. I am holding up The Future of Another Timeline by Annalee Newitt. Uh, people here might know Annalee Newitt for more than just uh, their writing. Uh, they're also the co-host with Charlie Jane Andrews of Our Opinions Are Correct, which I believe won the Yuko Award last year for Best Fan Cast, or the year before that, I'm not sure, but at least once. Uh, and I'm fascinated by this book for a variety of reasons. Uh, one is it's got a time travel uh, situation uh, method that I have not seen before in that there are uh, geological places on this earth, maybe six or seven, I can't remember the exact number anymore, uh, that were created millennia, millennia ago. No one knows how they got there. And the only way one's able to use them and become in sync with them, and it works by having them sort of create music and hitting them and making tones, is you have to actually live there for a while, maybe at least a year more than that, in order for your body to somehow acclimate to this spot. So time travel is not an easy thing uh, to hop around. Uh, the world and go back in time. And so what's going on in this particular story, uh, The Future of the Timeline by Annalie Newitz, I'll say it again just in case what that was not heard, is there's this time war that's going on. Uh, Anthony Comstock, for those who remember him, he was someone who was fighting uh, against uh, sending birth control information in the mail or anything relating to uh, sexuality and uh, it was involved in having postal regulations put in to get people arrested when they were uh, <laughs> mailing things like that around uh, is fighting a war against people from the future who are fighting for uh, the, you know the freedom which there's this future where there's a very mis misogynistic world and a, a world of uh, you know gender equality and diversity and all of that and there's an anti Comstock is sort of on one side and they go back uh, in time to try and prevent Anthony Comstock from um, achieving superiority there and suppressing uh, women's rights. And what happens with the futures is when you return from the past, if there have been changes to the future, uh, you have a memory of the future you left, but the people around you do not remember the future before it has been changed. So you've got that additional Philip uh, going on as well. So you've got multiple things going on. This fascinating time travel method and technology that that I haven't seen before, uh, you know, combined with fascinating things about uh, sex, gender, politics, uh, sexuality, and the future uh, in the current time of the novel, which is sort of our time, and you know, the past when that Comstack is going around and people are going back and forth throughout these times and bumping into each other. You know, the usual stuff that happens in time travel where you meet someone before they actually met you and also strange things are, are happening. So it's a fascinating uh, book. It came out, I think I was at the book launch. Uh, they were uh, traveling around the country doing uh, uh, a launch tour maybe a year ago. So it's only about uh, one year old. So Annalie knew it's the future of another timeline, uh, they know what they're talking about. They also helped launch io9, uh, Charlie Jane Andrews and uh, Annalie Newitz also did that as well. So they're, uh, writes wonderful nonfiction as well. So this is worth tracking down. And now Mary. Okay. Sorry to jump on you there. <laughs> well, let's leave room for Rachel as well, but okay. So um, I'd like to briefly 
um, talk about the Tensorate series of novellas by Neon Yang, published under their former name of J.Y. Yang. Um, and there are four at this point. I think that's complete, but you can never be sure. Um, the most recent one is from 2019, and the first two appeared in 2017. And they are... I, it's even hard to say whether they're science fiction or fantasy. They're about a, a different world, um, and they are very, very well told. And the author is very intelligent and very versatile, so they're told in different ways. The most recent one is told... Um, as a monologue, like a bar story, um, where the main character is saying this stuff from her past that ties into the three novellas beforehand. Um, but it's, it's like she's confessing to a stranger at a bar or telling them the story. The one before that is very much drier, brilliant almost, or maybe it is brilliant, I don't know where the line is where brilliant happens, um, but it's told in reports and trans transcripts of interviews and so on, um, rather than being uh, a regular narrative. And the first two are, I guess I would say, closer to regular story narratives. They all tie in together, they um, have interesting things to say about gender because um, in some but not all of the bits within this world, the characters don't choose their gender until they reach a certain age or until, you know, so they're born as a they and then they may choose to become a he or a she. Um, and there's an Asian, an Asian feel, I guess, to them, but not in any conspicuous sort of, um, it's not like we're reading about Japan. The whole place is much further from here than any, anywhere on earth. But mostly it's the skill of the author that impresses me. Um, she's clearly, they are clearly, sorry, I don't know why. Um, very, very good. And I look forward to seeing more. I'm um, not necessarily those books, but more than what they write in the future. Okay, and then uh, Rachel. I closed my notes like two minutes ago because that's how that <laughs> I didn't mean to close my notes. Come on, you can move. Um, well, I can just uh, improvise some of it. Um, so I wanted to recommend Ursula Vernon's Clockwork Boys. Oh my God. <laughs> Um, this is uh, one of the books where somebody was like, yeah, you, you read this to get back into reading. It's like a very good beach read. I'm not going to nominate it for any awards. And it, sometimes it reads like somebody's D&D campaign being written down and they don't really care. That's fine because it's by Ursula Vernon. Um, she is an extremely comic writer. Her characters are very accessible and um, uh, well, they're funny and they're down to earth. They're sort of stodgy and practical and they don't come across as very fantasy. This particular one is also uh, a romance. Um, so it has sad paladins and stuff in it. Uh, if you don't know, she is an artist and she, oh goodness. Well, they are, uh, T, uh, T. Kingfisher is Ursula Vernon, but thank you for pointing that out. Well, it just, if people are looking for them, um, yeah. then, Oh, now we're getting stuff. Yeah, no, no worries. Um, I actually just wanted to to make the, the connection again. So um, Ursula Vernon is an artist. Um, she has a substantial career and she tends, her art tends to be funny. She tends to work with a lot of anthropomorphized animals. These do feature in the novels as well. Um, and she has a penchant for bizarre imagery. Um, which comes across very well. Um, I don't know if you guys have been reading. Um, so Ali Broche of Hyperbole and a Half, this is not science fiction, no, um, came, yeah, just came out with a book called Solutions and Other Problems. Um, if you're not familiar with Ali Broche, she used to write a blog called Hyperbole and a Half. Um, she has had some very dramatic life events in the time, yes, 
and the time between she when she was last writing and now. Um, so some of the content, which is autobiographical, can be very dark. But Ali Broch's writing is so funny and relatable that even when it is very dark, it is usually still um, emotionally uh, moving to follow, not and not so much like going through a cheese grater. It's a stuff that you relate to. And also there's still lots and lots of stuff about dogs. So that's <laughs> about the world's stupidest dog, in fact, which is uh, how she titles it, but her dog is impressively thick. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I guess the other thing I was going to recommend, um, because I'll, I'll let Scaldi take care of himself. I've really enjoyed the lock-in <laughs> series though, um, is um, for middle grade, um, and YA, I'm going to recommend not a particular book, but Nova Rensuma. And now I'm going to lie and recommend a particular book, Walls Around Us. But Nova Rensuma writes these beautifully imagistic, cool, uh, literary oriented, or literary marketed young adult novels that often have a science fiction cast and they're just cool. And the other thing I was going to say that I noticed most science fiction writers don't know about unless they have kids is Wings of Fire. <laughs> okay, I have kids, but they're older now. I, I don't know that one. I so have, think my daughter loved them when she was slightly younger than she is now. She absolutely loved those books. They are very oriented for a particular age group. They are middle grade and they're very middle grade, um, which is not to say that older folks who grew up with them aren't super excited about them. Um, the books are by, what is my brain doing? Sutherland. T U I Sutherland. Yeah. Yes. And I know that. I, I really do know that, which I feel I need to specify because I've been helping to adapt the books into graphic novel format. Oh. <laughs> which is so fun. I love it. Um, I am just now learning how to do the layouts on my own and stuff like that. Very cool. Um, so the books are by Tweet Sutherland. Um, and they're very they're very middle grade. And if that's something that you want in your life they're extremely middle grade. And if it's not, you should probably not read them. But they're about the different, the different like, tribes of boring talking dragons. Yes, and you like dragons, then they're for you. Yeah. And you know, you could pick up the graphic novels, I wouldn't complain. Yeah. <laughs> Where are they being published, Rachel? I should know who's paying me, and I don't. First, is it the first, second people? Is it, do you know? Oh, no, we're through her original publisher um, because she is fine. sufficiently famous that, you know, <laughs> they don't really need to go to a new, yeah. <sighs> is there anything in the chat that we should be answering or is it okay? I didn't glance into okay. it. Okay, there is a, a question I want to make sure to pop to Scott because I think it was prompted by your description of the sort of places where you go time traveling bit. And someone just had a comic book reference wondering about your opinions on the old Adam Strange comic where he would get in the Zeta Ray at some random, you have to find it some random place on the earth. And the question was just like or dislike that little- Oh, no, no, and it's not like that at all. All Adam Strange had to do was find out where the beam was gonna hit in there and jump in the beam. This involves, uh, moving to a place and living there for maybe several years until your body acclimates. So tra traveling in time is not uh, an easy thing as it's set up, which is good because too often it's an easy fix. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I will throw up one just real quick for my second, but uh, I ran across a couple years ago. So it's called When the English Fall. I've always had this uh, love of sort of the post-apocalypse or the apocalyptic uh, novels, the end of the world. And this one takes an interesting bit. Uh, the end of the world is just like a, an event that wipes out all electricity and takes down all of sort of our power webs and everything connected. But what makes the novel interesting and what the title is referring to is that the focus of it's on an Amish community uh, in Southeast Pennsylvania. So it's like the one community of people who are not directly affected by this because they don't have electricity anyway. Uh, so have a different perspective on the, uh, the whole event, although sort of the social collapse and the violence that engenders 
creeps closer and closer to their community, which then puts them in a sort of moral dilemma of what to do about it, given the Amish commitment to pacifism. So it's an interesting twist on the, uh, the apocalyptic uh, novel. So yeah, we are down to our last five minutes. So this is probably a good place if uh, anyone's got sort of last minute things you want to put a pitch for. If any attendees want to throw a question or a recommendation into the chat, do it quick. And Mary has something in mind. Um, well, I've been looking for things that would entertain me and divert me and maybe delight me. Um, I've been wanting to escape into things and right. um, some things that did that for me during this time are um, Ben Aronovich's Rivers of London series, of which the most recent is from this year, um, but it, he began writing them a while ago and they're um, urban fantasy detective stories set in England. I, I found them very fun. They're slightly, I suppose, I mean, there's crime, you know, the, um, supernatural crime. Um, and then Luan McMaster Bujold has been writing a series of novellas, the Penrick and Desdemona novellas. And Penrick is a very sweet young man who gets um, his mind partially possessed by a centuries old female demon. He is very sweet and she's much less sweet, but she's um, a great character, unlikable, just not sweet. Um, and there, I found those thoroughly enjoyable. Um, and then, which is sort of a guilty pleasure, there's a book um, called Mind Touch, which is a male-male um, friendship, but not, but, but not romance, really. Um, science fiction, which I just, I don't know. It, it swept me up into it. I completely loved reading it. Then I went on to read some other things by the author, which I wasn't the right reader for, but that particular one, Mind Touch by MCA Hogarth, it just seemed so sweet. Such a, there was cooking. They were baking cookies, and it was just <laughs> just what I needed during a pandemic. <laughs> Anyone else in our last couple of minutes here? Okay, one quickie for Docile by K. M. Spara, which uh, came out about six months ago. It is a book which fully earns its trigger warning, and for anyone who's read it, as much as any book I've read in a in a long time. Basically, the concept is a future people indenture themselves to others to pay off their debts and take a drug called Dosaline, which makes them forget everything that happens while they're indentured. Uh, there are rules and that there's certain things the people to whom they're indentured are not supposed to do to them. Uh, but with the, with the events of the novel occur when one particular person says, I'm going to do this to pay off my debts, but I refuse to take the drug and I'm going to live through whatever happens to me and everything in the novel happens through that. It's a tough read it sometimes for some people, but uh, I think you'll hear a lot about it and it's worth uh, tracking down. I'd go on longer, but we're in our last few minutes. All right, I just want to also just mention really quickly, uh, the new Kate Elliott, Unconquerable Son. She started out writing science, well, actually no, she wrote a, fan a portal fantasy and then she wrote science fiction for a chunk of books and then she wrote fantasy, but this is science fiction. And it is, uh, she called it gender flip Alexander the Great in space. And Alexander the Great is not my favorite person. I'm sorry. I'm so tired of Alexander the Great. But it is very tense, very political, and with uh, that kind of dysfunctional family that is struggling in some ways for power and position, and a kind of brash but incredibly competent in her own way, main character. It's just, it's, it is really good space opera. Um, but just a little bit more, and there's a sense of meat to it. So I think that people who also have Alex Alexander the Great allergies, I'm really sorry, would actually really like it. So we're at the end of our time. I would tell people, so the Discord channel is where you can go to sort of continue. Uh, Scott likened it to, it's the hallway outside the meeting rooms. And the link to that's at the very beginning of our chat. So if you scroll up to the top of your chat at 8.01, uh, we put the link there. So if you want to hang in the virtual hallway and continue the conversations, go and find that and click on it quickly before we sort of 
end the meeting here. Uh, but thanks everyone. Thanks to our panelists. Uh, hopefully everyone was jotting down all of the, uh, the great recommendations. I have several pages here. Thanks to our panelists for putting everything in the chat so that uh, folks could to jot things down. And you can save the chat too to a file. If okay. you go under that little little three dots there in the lower right hand corner, save chat. It'll save it in your documents folder. Okay, so if you want to keep all of those, yeah, just the bottom of the chat. I'm and will it save now. them all distinctly, separately? It should. Or just in a mass of book titles. Because I also together. shared <laughs> links to both Yang and uh, Walton's episodes of the podcast where we talk about their work. I didn't put Rachel's in there, but you can find her by searching uh, as well to hear us talk about their work. Well, thank you, everybody. It was a really terrific panel. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Alan, thanks for moderating. Next year in the real flesh meat space world. Okay.